So to wrap things up, we have Dr. Don Flayton, who probably doesn't need much of a, a introduction either. Um, but many of you know that Don, of course, is a yet to currently still working at the University of Manitoba. Um, soon to retire. I can say that we have you still for 14 more days, but nobody's counting. Um, and uh, except for probably you. <laughs> And, uh, and so Don is here today to give us a presentation on nutrient misbehavior, uh, learning from my mistakes. And I'm very curious to hear what you have to say, Don. So take it away, take it home. Thanks for the introduction, Marla. And um, yeah, I had, to, I had to modify this title a little bit because after I thought about what I'd submitted there and calling it nutrient misbehavior and learning from my mistakes, I thought that's not really a good title because um, professors are supposed to be infallible. And, and Marla knows this because I was her supervisor and I was always right. And I have to continue to maintain that uh, image. So I, I have to change my title here to learning from the unexpected. It wasn't necessarily mistakes. This was, it's just the unexpected. And, and within this topic, boy, there's lots that I could work with. There, I'm only going to present a few of my mistake, I mean, unexpected results, because um, I've got lots. Um, if we take a look at, at, at some of the things that I've done, and this is literally the piece of scrap paper that I started working on my ideas for all the mistakes that I've made. It just, it's just a bewildering um, array of stuff. And, and, I, and I had about two hours worth of presentation that I'm trying to compress down to this next uh, 40 minutes or so. So anyways, I, I will be just sharing a few of my experiences with NPKS and, and try to show exactly uh, what I mean by the unexpected and, and how important it is, especially in prairie agriculture, to keep our eyes open for the things that might not necessarily always work out according to um, what we expect. The first project I'm going to talk about is Kevin Thiessen's uh, master's project where he was looking at fall applied nitrogen in various portions of the landscape. And we were building our hypothesis on, on the expectation that fall applied nitrogen would be 20% less efficient than spring applied in. But there might be some variations within that landscape. And where did we get that hypothesis from? Well, you know, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, he came out with the Ten Commandments, but that was only part of his load. Um, John Hurd was with him and he came out with the soil fertility guide as well. And in that soil fertility guide, it says that if you've got fall broadcast versus spring broadcast, there's a 20% uh, difference in efficiency. If you've got fall banded versus spring banded, you've got a 20% difference in efficiency. That's what we expected to find. Results didn't necessarily turn out to match expectations. We did this trial. Uh, across a variety of locations, most of them in the Red River Valley. So the high versus low landscape positions are very, very subtle in terms of their difference, just a few centimeters of difference in elevation, but it's where water would pond for a little bit in the springtime before planting this field, which would look, you know, to the casual observer to be very level. And when we looked at the results overall from all the site years, uh, there was a 20% loss in efficiency for the fall applied compared to the spring applied, but only in the low landscape positions and only when that was applied early in the fall. If we applied that fall banded nitrogen in the upper slope positions in the later part of October, there was no loss of that 20% in efficiency. So that, that surprised us and that impressed us that we, you know, we've got we've got more situations to consider than just the average uh, when we're dealing with fall applied nitrogen. And one of the things that I'd like to point out is that these results from just a few meters of separation between a low part of a field and a higher part of the field match the difference in efficiency that they measured with a series of 22 broadcast trials back in the 1970s, like 45, 50 years ago, working with broadcast fertilizer. They found that if you went from the Manitoba lowlands and the Red River Valley to like the Brandon area or Western Manitoba, you found that the broadcast nitrogen suffered about a 20% loss in efficiency if it was in the Red River Valley compared to Westman. But something interesting to note across these 22 experiments is that there's a huge loss in efficiency 
from fall broadcast compared to spring broadcast nitrogen. In these trials, 22 site years, 30 to 50% loss in efficiency for fall broadcast versus spring broadcast. So when it comes to the um, uh, evaluation of uh, fall broadcast as a uh, suitable sort of method of, of, of applying nitrogen, uh, we don't do research on fall broadcast anymore for these sorts of reasons, just, just too inefficient. And here's another project that followed up on that a couple of years later from Kevin Teeson's work. This is Aaron Williamson's master's project. And this picture, um, I think that it, it, it's something that, that should be noted. This is at the Indian Head um, Research Farm. So this is a, a, a plot that actually Chris Holzaffel was helping with. And this is Aaron at the site, visiting the site. And she was not only measuring the agronomic response to different timings and sources of nitrogen, she was also measuring the emissions of nitrous oxide uh, greenhouse gas. And what we had thought was if we had a um, uh, an inhibitor in with that nitrogen fertilizer that would slow down the formation of nitrate that would reduce the risk of nitrous oxide emissions from the denitrification process and it would increase yield be good for everybody and everything. And uh, the concept is based on the idea that most of our losses of nitrous oxide were going to be coming from denitrification when the soil was saturated like in early spring or late fall and the microbes needed an alternative source of, of oxidizing agent, they would turn to that nitrate nitrogen. And if we could block that process of the conversion of ammonium to nitrate, or at least slow it down, that we'd have less nitrous oxide emission and more nitrogen left to feed the crop. When we did that work though, across those six site years, we found no significant differences for fall versus spring applied conventional urea and no benefit from double inhibited urea equivalent of super U. And in fact, when we use pure calcium nitrate, which had no ammonium in it at all, and was fully 100% nitrate in, there was no penalty in terms of nitrogen conversion into yield. And so this surprised us. We had expected to see these great things happen, but these are relatively dry fall conditions and early spring conditions that meant that we did not have conditions that were that conducive to large losses of nitrogen. When it came to the nitrous oxide emission, lots of variability, and there were no significant differences overall across sources and timings. So the fall applied nitrogen wasn't worth Worse than the spring applied nitrogen. There was no difference between the conventional urea and the uh, enhanced efficiency urea. And in fact, even when we had fall banded pure calcium nitrate, there was no um, reduction. Uh, for me, there was, there was no increase in the loss, which is something we had expected. In fact, we only had one site year out of the six where we had a significant effect on nitrous oxide emission from the different sources. And that difference was at Indian Head in fall 2006 to summer of 2007 and there was a highly significant reduction in nitrous oxide emission associated with the pure nitrate treatment. And this just illustrates how important it is to anticipate that under different environmental conditions you can see different results in terms of the impact of these enhanced efficiency fertilizer products depending on which process is responsible for the nitrous oxide emission. And so, for example, we had anticipated that all the nitrous oxide or the majority of it would be coming from the reduction of nitrate during denitrification. What we hadn't really considered was how important the nitrification process is to contributing nitrous oxide in our prairie environment. If that nitrogen was supplied fully in this nitrate form, the nitrous oxide emissions were remarkably low. And this process of the conversion of ammonium to nitrate is probably a substantial contributor to our nitrous oxide uh, sort of footprint. And it's something that we need to probably anticipate a little bit more. Anyways, since we conducted this experiment uh, 15 years ago, there's been a lot more advances in terms of the technology and technique for measuring nitrous oxide. And so uh, Mario set, shared with you earlier this afternoon, some much more uh, impressive sort of data on reduction in nitrous oxide with enhanced efficiency fertilizer products. But in this particular trial, once again, we got the unexpected.
So another project we did with uh, wheat fertilization was uh, mentioned earlier this morning um, when uh, the, we had a discussion about uh, wheat variety responses to, to nitrogen treatments. The uh, project that Amy Monger managed on behalf of our group was uh, high yielding wheat uh, management strategies. And uh, we wanted to see what we could get for some more refined uh, recommendations on rate, for example. There was also some placement timing source stuff in there, but I'm only going to report on the rate response today. And we thought that, you know, if we got some really good rate response data, we could use this sophisticated quadratic plateau model. The statistical model, this yield response, a curve to estimate exactly how much nitrogen would be economically optimum for spring wheat under these high yielding conditions with these new varieties. And the reason we picked the quadratic model, quadratic plateau model, was based on this paper that came out of Iowa. And they published, uh, Manuel Serrato, this paper that showed, you know, depending on what response curve you followed, you'd come up with dramatically different optimum rates of nitrogen fertilizer. And so they looked at these four different models. And if they thought that the nitrogen response went up to a certain point and then it leveled off, that linear plateau model, they got an excellent fit with that data. And they would recommend 95 pounds of N per acre. But if they went with it, having a curvilinear response and then leveling off, that's a quadratic plus plateau, they would be actually be recommending 150 pounds an acre if they did the math. The quadratic model, a response curve that most people use, and I think that was probably the model that you were referring to earlier today, for example, Chris, um, and it's also what North Dakota State University uses for their corn response uh, recommendations. The N rate that would give you the optimum economic return would be 200 pounds per acre, quite a bit higher than these other models. And then if you pick the square root model, which has a slight increase in yield going, uh, continuing on right up to 350 pounds of N per acre, the optimum rate of N would be 260. So huge difference in optimum N rate recommendation, depending on what response curve you're going to use. Now with a lot of Detailed statistical analysis, Manuel Serrato determined that the quadratic plus plateau was the most uh, stable, reliable, accurate way to protect nitrogen recommendations in this particular study. And if would, in this particular um, data set, it would be like 160 pounds of N, pardon me, 150 pounds of N for 160 bushels of corn. That makes sense. About one pound of N per bushel of corn. That makes sense. So we decided to take the data from Amy's project and run it through the statistical analysis. And she did this analysis and she looked for the best statistical model for the end response curve for the various site years and the two varieties that she was working with. And she just got a scattering of optimum fit. This is using what's called the Akaik information criterion in statistics to determine the best fit model. It varied not only from site year to site year, but also from variety to variety, depending on whether it was Brandon or Prosper wheat that was being planted. And you'll note that there's a gap in this table. There wasn't a single site year where either Brandon or Prosper wheat were best described in terms of their nitrogen response with the quadratic plateau model. So this really turned out weird and we thought well we don't have very reliable data for getting these really super accurate response curves so we just went with some means comparisons and this is something that Ann showed earlier this morning we looked at the optimum nitrogen supply per bushel just using comparisons of the various treatments very simple minded sort of approach it came up with an average of two and a quarter pounds n per bushel but our super sophisticated approach that we'd hoped to use just didn't pan out Another bright idea that we had was, okay, what about the nitrogen fertility measurements to measure the, um, the uh, amount of nitrogen that comes out during the, um, during the growing season, the mineralizable N? How would we adjust for that? And we, could we find a way to estimate that? Maybe doing a soil test measurement. And so 
We looked at a series of chemical analyses that might predict the mineralizable end. We also looked at the um, Les Henry incubation test, where Les has um, recommended you know, maybe just leaving your soil sample to incubate at room temperature for a month and see how much nitrogen comes out over that one month period. And that had worked really well. That one month incubation test worked out really well for some growth chamber go chamber trials that we ran and uh, so we got excited about using it for the field studies and here's what happened when we looked at our long-term manure management site at Glen Lee these different manure sources and rates we got 30 percent of the variability in nitrogen mineralization was explained with that incubation test so even on the same site in the same year we could explain only 30 percent of the variability in in-season release of nitrogen with that incubation test because there's different things happening with respect to temperature and moisture sort of differences across that site. Here's what we found in Amy's trial. The high yielding spring wheat trial was completely non-significant. If we looked across all the eight site years, there was no relationship between the incubation test nitrogen and the amount of nitrogen that actually came out during the growing season. And Lanny Gardner also uh, used that method, the incubation test, to estimate mineralization in his corn fertilization study. And he got no relationship whatsoever between the real mineralization and the estimated mineralization from just a moist soil sitting in, in at room temperature for a month. And that's because the conditions in the field are not the same as in a lab. So to summarize the nitrogen uh, response uh, or nitrogen studies that didn't really work out according to expectations, we found that a variability of efficiency for the fall applied end could be just as large within a field as it is going from the Red River Valley to Brandon, Manitoba, even in the same year. That the fall emissions, probably fall applied end doesn't always result in greater emissions of nitrous oxide and that even the enhanced efficiency fertilizers don't always give you a reduction in nitrous oxide. Sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. And one of the challenges is we're getting nitrous oxide from nitrification, probably more so than we are from denitrification. The optimum economic rates of end fertilizer with the sophisticated kind of response curves uh, is a very difficult challenge, even with good data. And measuring mineralizable end with a soil test does not predict how much nitrogen is going to be mineralized during the growing season under real uh, growing season conditions. So anyways, that didn't quite work out according to expectations. We decided, well, okay, what we're going to have to do now is switch to another nutrient. So we went with uh, some sulfur studies, Chris Unger's master's project. And we know that nitrogen and sulfur are both required for proteins. And we know that sulfur can really enhance bread making proteins, specifically gluten quality. And here's a photo from the 1938 Breton plots. So this is like what I guess this is over 80 years old this data here's the check without sulfur fertilizer and all these other treatments here had sulfur fertilizer you get more extensible dough higher low volumes if you have sulfur there as well as nitrogen and so one of the things we wanted to find out was whether we could get a benefit in terms of bread making quality even where we didn't get an increase in yield in other words let's say we had enough sulfur for yield could we get even better quality if we added some sulfur fertilizer? So Chris had some sites in collaboration with UGG, and this reveals my age, United Grain Growers. Probably a lot of you have never heard of UGG. But anyways, uh, a Western Canadian grain company across Western Canada. And we had 12 uh, site years in soil test conditions that ranged from 24 to 264 pounds of S, a good range there. And various ratios of nitrogen and sulfur being applied as urea and ammonium sulfate. We had only two out of the 12 sites give us an, a yield response to S. And then we had 10 out of 12 sites then where there was no response yield wise to that sulfur fertilizer. And indeed, when Chris looked at the um, regression equations for grain S concentrations versus yield across all of his replicates, no relationship whatsoever, no improvement in yield from the application of the sulfur at these sites. But when he looked at the improvement in low volume, a very strong relationship when you looked at the improvement in the dough extensibility that creates the opportunity for improved low volume, once again, a good strong relationship. So 
definite benefits in terms of grain quality from supplemental S over and above what you would need to reach the optimum yield. So it's a no brainer, there's no question. Sulfur is going to increase protein quality, even where you're not getting any increase in yield. So what was wrong with our expectations? We actually thought that the grain industry would give a crap about this. No one in the wheat market cares enough about sulfur concentration in wheat to pay farmers one thin dime for that improvement in quality. So there's no benefit for a wheat farmer to purchase additional and apply additional sulfur. No incentive or reward whatsoever in the marketplace. So that just sits in a thesis someplace um, gathering dust. Anyway, so moving on to another nutrient, maybe we could find some success with some phosphorus trials and Gustavo Bardella did a lot of phosphorus trials with uh, soybeans and he had sites all over the place and it, we had great expectations because soybean is a real pig for phosphorus. And um, we thought, well, we're going to get P responses with, with soybeans for sure. And, and high rates of seed row P, we know that uh, soybeans are supposed to be very sensitive to seed row toxicity. So we thought we'd get some really spectacular uh, results uh, in this trial. And he was able to collaborate with a broad, broad group of people. And John Hurd was instrumental in helping to set this up. 28 site years, uh, half of them had 10 ppm or less Olsen P and uh, three rates of phosphate and seed row place, sideband or broadcast, all sorts of different um, ways of putting on the phosphate at different rates. In the end though, only one out of 28 site years gave us response to P. And my goodness, that was a surprise. And in fact, we were also surprised that we had only two site years where these high rates of P actually in the seed row were detrimental to yield. But we were lucky to get decent uh, moisture in the spring, probably to decrease some of that seed row toxicity. But boy, oh boy, not very many responses to P with soybeans. So along comes a graduate student to give us another shot at seeing P responses and Magda Rosgalski looking at some side banded phosphorus in corn production systems. And especially if you're growing corn after canola, which non mycorrhizal crop could we see responses to uh, starter P or in strip till situations, some of these special concerns that the corn growers had and she went at it and we've presented this data before, you've probably seen it before. Spectacular responses in early season biomass, over twice as much growth with side banded P compared to no side banded P. A weak advancement in maturity in terms of tasseling, two to 3% less grain moisture and 10% improvement in grain yield. Some of the classic old style pictures of these spectacular uh, P responses in mid growing season, all of it making a very simple message. Yep in our cold soils and with a warm season crop like corn side banding starter pea really really important then along comes dixon tran to do some work and we had always wrestled with which hybrid to use for magda's trials because we knew that there was some evidence in the literature just some obscure work that pointed towards differences in pea response across different hybrids and when he did his work with eight different decalb hybrids he found that there was an overall benefit to applying P starter. The small yield increase that worked out okay across all the varieties, or probably all the hybrids overall. But there was one hybrid that really stood out and that happened to be Magda's hybrid that was driving most of that response. There was actually a treatment by hybrid interaction. Most of the response to side banded starter P was in that one particular hybrid that Magda uh, used for her trial. So the, the results that we saw from Magda's work are, were spectacular, but they may not necessarily represent a wide spectrum of what you can expect across all the hybrids in Matoba. And, and Dixon's still working on his MSC thesis, and we'll have that available for you within the next few months.
So one more topic in the phosphorus side is the phosphorus loss to water that we've been working on collaboration with David Lobb and, and others. And one of the things that we had anticipated going into these studies was that, you know, based on American research that water erosion would be the big problem. So we would have benefits to soil conservation project practices like conservation tillage or perennial forage or vegetative buffers would cut down on our phosphorus losses. And in fact, um, Esther Salvano and her postdoc did some preliminary work that started to cast a little bit of doubt on this because she looked at 14 watersheds in Manitoba and looked at the soil erosion risk in those watersheds compared to the phosphorus in that water that was coming out of that watershed and she found no relationship whatsoever. That should have been our first clue. Then Kevin Thiessen came back for a postdoc and he did some work to look at um, a uh, pair of watersheds west of Miami in the South Tobacco Creek watershed and in the years before they introduced conservation tillage to this uh, second watershed here the measurements show that there was actually only a small amount of the phosphorus loss from those two watersheds was in the form of particulate P from erosion. So the blue part of that bar represents the amount of P that's lost from erosion in those two watersheds. And when that second watershed was converted over to conservation tillage, and we went back in there to measure the phosphorus loss 10 years later, uh, there was only a slight reduction in the phosphorus loss by erosion in the particulate form, but actually there was a big increase in the amount of phosphorus loss from the dissolved fraction the sort of phosphorus T and so phosphorus loss actually went up rather than down with the conservation tillage practice. So it's something that we had to anticipate. We have to anticipate is that we don't always see um, the benefits in terms of water quality and phosphorus loss if we're introducing an erosion control practice that actually increases our dissolved P. Some more data from another related trial, and that was annual crop that was fertilized compared to perennial forage that was not fertilized. And this is, this is conventional till, fertilized annual crop, and it didn't lose nearly as much phosphorus as a perennial forage field that wasn't receiving any phosphorus fertilizer. And that's because a lot of the phosphorus in our snowmelt runoff is coming from the vegetation. So what did we learn from our phosphorus trials? Well, phosphorus fertilizer response in soybeans, much less than we expected. Starter P more important for some horn hybrids than others, certainly not as simple as we thought. And water erosion is not the main cause of our phosphorus loss. So it's not gonna be solved very easily with an erosion control practice. So the phosphorus didn't turn out as particularly um, well compared to expectations. The nitrogen didn't, the sulfur didn't. Well, what about potassium? So we're getting, getting desperate here and, and doing some potassium work. And once again, soybean is a pig for potassium with its high requirement for potassium. Surely to goodness, it's gonna to respond to K fertilizer. And so here's Megan Burns in her um, master's project. She was evaluating in a variety of different sort of uh, types of sites, the effect of this soil test threshold and also placement. We thought the banded potash would be more efficient than broadcast potash on our soil. So she started her trials and in the early part of the growing seasons, we'd see these phosphor these potassium deficiency symptoms showing up in her trials with great expectations of a big potassium fertilizer response. In the end though, there was no yield response at any of her site years, seven site years worth of, of, of hard work, early season deficiency symptoms, low K showing up in the tissue test and no response. Here's the data across all seven sites summarized. 30, 60, 120 pounds of K2O per acre, side banded broadcast incorporation, no significant differences. And we had hoped that that, well, I shouldn't say we would hope, we had expected that, that there'd be a response up to 100 part per million soil test P, we could expect that the control treatment would be yielding quite a bit less than the fertilized treatment and then that it would finally match it at 100 part per million. That was sort of our working hypothesis that we'd get um, a poor yield in our control until we reached 100 part per million and then it would finally match the yield of the, of the fertilized treatments. But here's the small plot trials. 
there's no upward relationship there up to that 100 ppm and 100 percent level there's no upward uh, trend there either in the microplots within the on-farm strip trials. Then we were collaborating with the Manitoba Pulse and Soybean Growers with their full-scale strip trials on-farm. There's no line like that there either. So the soil test threshold wasn't working very well, not at least uh, in these particular trials. Part of the reason, if I go back to this picture that I showed you a few minutes ago, there's a lot of patchiness within these fields in terms of the potassium deficiency that introduces variability that is hard to work with statistically. It makes it much more difficult to detect the responses. That was one thing. But there, we're also convinced that soybeans are tapping into another reserve of K, just like they were tap, tapping into another reserve of P. And, and in the second year of her field trials, Megan did a really uh, good study where she included barley in the same experiment as the soybeans. And she found that when she was working in these low K soils, there was no response in soybeans at the same sites where very consistently across all of her site years in that year, she got an average of a 20% increase in yield in barley. So big differences between crops in terms of K response, no response in soybean, in any of those seven site years. In the three site years though, second year of a study, 20% yield increase in barley. So the soil test works for barley. It just isn't working very well for soybeans. So the potassium research that we did shows us that the supply and demand balance there was way more complex than we thought. There's lots of variation within the sites that makes it more challenging to pick up differences in yield response. Also variation in time, the early season K deficiency symptoms that we saw, the tissue test that indicated that a K response was likely did not translate into yield responses. And then crop species wise as well, barley responded as expected. The soil test worked fine for the barley crop, but it did not predict the soybean responses. So once again, more complex than we had anticipated. So overall and here's another indication that it's time to retire how many of you can remember white out oh my goodness yes okay thanks tammy <laughs> back when we used to type right <laughs> we used to have to have white out but anyways what are some of the mistakes that we meant but one of the unexpected what are some of the unexpected things we, we discovered well the main theme is that our agronomic and environmental responses to our nutrient soil and water management practices are much more complex and difficult to predict than we expected there is more challenge there than most people realize it varies greatly with crop factors not only from one species to another like soybeans versus barley in the potassium soil test, but also from one variety or hybrid to another. The wheat varieties didn't respond the same way to nitrogen fertilizer exactly. And we also saw that the corn hybrids didn't are not responding the same way to starter phosphorus. Temporal factors. Time is an important factor and moisture and temperature are affecting nutrient supply. You can't always go with the mineralizable N estimate from an incubation test, assuming that that's going to work in the field. The effectiveness of BMPs for snowmelt dominated runoff conditions don't match up with uh, erosion driven uh, situations. Spatial factors, variations in soil fertility like potassium or moisture conditions like the high versus low areas in the response to fall applied nitrogen, pH and salinity. These can vary as much across a few meters within a field as they can over hundreds of kilometers within the province. So it's a lot more complex than most people realize. And so refining our nutrient soil and water management practices is going to require a lot more agronomic knowledge and care than is often applied in precision agriculture. I'll be right up front and say that there's a lot of people that don't have enough knowledge of technique and process and principles to go along with that technology. <laughs> 
And there's a lot of us that don't have enough knowledge of that principles. It's something that still needs a lot more work. So we need a much more careful diagnosis and treatment required on a case by case basis. I really liked what Andrew McGuire said earlier this afternoon, talking about a problem based approach. Understanding what's going on in terms of your soil fertility problem requires a lot of insight and doesn't matter whether we're just focused on the agronomic side or the economic or the environmental or combination of all three. We need to understand what's going on. And in crop monitoring and nutrient application could help to address this temporal variability. I think this is one of the greatest opportunities for technology is to help us understand what's going on with that crop over time and across space to determine what might be limiting that crop as it is growing through that growing season. And I got inspired about this uh, in a very rare experience where I was actually at a Winnipeg Jets hockey game. Remember when there used to be like people going into hockey games and watching, you know, thousands of spectators. And anyways, it was the third period of this game between the Jets and the Washington Capitals. And Winnipeg was up three nothing with only a minute and 20 seconds left to play. And I thought, you know what, I could bet on this game and I probably have a pretty good idea who's going to win. And, and I'm thinking, it just sort of happened in my mind that I was wondering, this is sort of what we've been working on with some of our crop surveillance, uh, you know, uh, leaf reflectance kind of monitoring. If, if we can use these tools to learn more about what's happening across time and space, uh, maybe we can fine tune our, um, our fertility management a little bit more. And so I think that there is a future for this technology. It's just going to be applied maybe in some, some ways that we haven't anticipated. We certainly aren't making much progress in terms of predicting, you know, in field, in crop, uh, nitrogen mineralization potential, but we could, we could monitor crops maybe a lot more carefully for their, for their end status during the growing season. The last thing I want to say is that, um, Maybe just sort of parting words. I think we also, we just need to really keep in mind how important it is to keep track of principles and, and the scientific concepts that underpin agronomy, and especially with respect to soil fertility responses. And I encourage all of you uh, to keep your eyes, ears, and mind open, use them to continue learning. And especially from mistakes, it doesn't matter whether they're your mistakes or my mistakes or anybody else's mistakes. Um, it's an opportunity for all of us to learn and we want, we need to embrace that opportunity. And with that, I'd also like to acknowledge that the mistakes that I've learned from have, um, I, I've benefited greatly from the advice of other people and colleagues. And I just want to acknowledge that over the last uh, 33 years that I've been with the University of Manitoba, I've been very, very fortunate to work with uh, fantastic people uh, in the university uh, as students and as colleagues, but also outside the university. So thank you very much for, for a wonderful 33 years. I don't know how I feel about that going off to the sunset uh, and view there, Don. Hey, that's that's right near our family's farm <laughs> in Weyburn, Saskatchewan, where social distancing is natural. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, thank you for that. We have many questions that have come in. I'm going to pull up a couple here. Um, uh, what about, so with regards to the, the P and K issue for soybeans, so what about front loading P or K for soybeans a year ahead of time and getting time for that to get into the soil solution, would we potentially then see a yield bump in those lower testing soils? I, to be honest, I don't think in our soils, soybeans are going to care. Uh, I think that if we take a look at our 120 pounds per acre broadcast and incorporated, um, that should give us about the most uh, water soluble K in solution as you could ever ask for. And it still didn't give us any benefit whatsoever at any site. So now, by, but I mean, in, in other parts of the world, they are getting big K responses. I think that honestly, that the soybeans are tapping into different reserves of P and K. And I think that if we understood more about the rhizosphere processes with the soybean plant is doing to that zone next to the root, we might be able to understand it, but I, I don't think it's a timing or a placement issue. But I've been wrong before. <laughs>
I have to say on a personal note, I was really I, a little relieved that my thesis didn't end up making I know, I, I didn't have the courage to take you on. <laughs> All right, well, with that, I am actually, there's still a few more questions. I'm hoping that maybe you have the time to like look at some of the Q&A questions and maybe answer them and type them in.